All right, I think I am ready to go. Unfortunately, my uh, hold on here. This is the danger of going live. Hang in there, people. I'm getting there. Um, okay, so welcome to Facebook Live and to YouTube Live. And I just need to give a shout out to my son who said this wasn't going to work because <laughs> it might not work before we're done. Uh, all right, so welcome to Sunday night and we are doing a couple things. I just announced a few minutes ago that I was starting my fast and that the fasting um, uh, for Sundays is something I've been doing several weeks now. I had a really good run of this over the summer and that was great, uh, but then I took a pause for several weeks and in the last few weeks I've had several people request that I do it again. So I've been working on that. Um, Sunday nights seem to be a really good fit for the rest of my Sorry for the technical issues here. <laughs> Sunday nights seem to be a really good fit for my patients when they get a, a reset. And starting a fast intermittently uh, once a week is very um, beneficial for your health. Uh, several of the parts of chapters of my book were definitely um, focused on improving my mom's health as she was addressing her cancer needs. Um, without the cancer needs, um, one more little thing here. Without the cancer needs improving, uh, without her cancer needs, we would have probably never dived in as deep as we did to say how, um, how do we help somebody at 71 who had a wilted immune system, wilted energy cycle, was 10 years into her cancer battle, um, and intermittent fasting was something that we have learned way more about as time went on, but um, boy, it's been a great addition to our lives. Uh, Grandma Rose marks two and a half years, um, almost two and a half years, not quite two and a half years, since uh, her, since I started writing that book. Uh, the book is Any Way You Can and is a uh, something, it's a love letter to my mom. I wasn't planning on writing a book, but she was struggling with cancer and I kept notes on how to teach her how to be uh, in ketosis and why that would matter for her life. I kept the notes and my husband, God bless him, <laughs> encouraged me to write a book and it's been super helpful for so many people. But on Sunday nights is when we start the fast and so I try to check in live on a video. So um, if you're out there watching, uh, this is an audience of talking to myself. So telling me where you're from is really helpful and it's also just encouraging to me. This is kind of one of those 20 seconds of courage moments where you step up and say, I've had way more popularity than I was planning on. Uh, I put these videos out on YouTube for my patients and about six weeks ago they started a trend which was fun and then about four weeks ago it kind of went a little nutty and has shot up to the point where I've had to revamp a few things like my website and a few of my pamphlets that just I couldn't meet the demand of people. So. If you're out there and you've had some frustrations with any of the orders you've placed, I ask for a little grace and forgiveness. We're working on it. I, it's just been a, a really great blessing I wasn't planning on, which is that people really are connecting with the message about how to get healthier with a ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. So today I started my post or my fast um, earlier today. In our family, we have a couple things that happen on Sundays as a tradition. We go to church, and when we get home from church, we set up a name a game of settlers and um, I have three teenagers and this year we have a, um, a an addition we have three teenage sons um, and then this year we have a uh, uh, foreign exchange student from China so the four teenagers and mom and dad sat down at the table to play settlers and during settlers we have a ketogenic snack and that's really the last meal that I'll have for the for the beginning of my fast um, but I tried to post it today just to show you what it is that I eat for my last meal and we had some leftover ribs and some 
sour cream with hot sauce that I like to dip my my meat into. And then um, that'll mark the beginning of my fast, which was a few hours ago. Uh, but this post is answering some questions that have come out through the last uh, couple of weeks that I haven't taken time for. Um, that uh, what do you drink while you're on a fast? And what counts? And I have a great uh, reach out over the last week that somebody posted or sent me an email with so many of their questions about fasting that um, one of the questions has been a thread through several emails and I decided to make that the focus of today, of tonight which is what are some of the things that I think are safe to drink while you're on a fast? Um, let's start with uh, the caveat that fasting is a skill. When I first fasted, I had so much bone broth, I think my sweat smelled like bone broth. And I'm not joking, <laughs> I think I smelled like a chicken. Uh, it was so much, I just wasn't good at not eating. So every time I felt a wave of hunger, I was really wimpy and I drank a lot of calories in bone broth, but I didn't care because I was learning the skill and my blood sugars were very evident that they continued to improve. Uh, Grandma Rose, if you've read the book, uh, entered a chapter where there was a kind of a do or die moment where she had to fast and her fasting was um, uh, a very powerful but uh, energetic uh, solution was to have one fourth of bone broth a day. And um, we made sure that her bone broth was um, uh, gelatinous uh, at the, uh, this is, if you can't see that, this is, I tried to make, take some out of the, the container. We make bone broth from uh, chicken bones. And this one has, I think, a couple of rib bones that were in it too. But if you see that's jello-like, and the reason that is uh, jello-like is because there's so much glucosamine um, in this, um, in this uh, bone broth. So if your bone broth gels at room temperature, you can be proud <laughs> that it, it actually has quite a bit of bone, of, um, of the, uh, the um, nutrients that we wanted Grandma Rose to be living off of. And that is in part glucosamine. The better part of the glucosamine that she needed, which was the anti-inflammatory part for her cancer is actually N-acetyl glucosamine, otherwise shortened to NAG. I have a couple of blogs that I'm writing about that that seem like no big deal until you're fighting a serious illness. And then the data on that, which really started about 2011, has been fabulous on helping people really repair their systems. Uh, I wanna just ask for forgiveness here for just a second. One of the uh, devices has a battery that's about to die, so let me quickly fix that. Uh, for the record, I've made probably every mistake possible that comes from uh, having uh, a YouTube Live or a Facebook Live. So I've already had the your battery died scenario, I've had your phone froze scenario, and I mean literally. Um, so sorry about that. All right, so getting back to bone broth is one of the things that I do think uh, is safe to have during your fast. Um, not only is it usually, I mean, you don't drink it gelatinous, that would taste terrible, but you heat it up and it's warm, it's very comforting, and then you make it pretty darn salty. The salt inside the bone broth is very helpful for um, not just uh, uh, kind of putting out the satiety, but there's lots of minerals that get flushed when you're doing a fast. And as your body is trying to compensate for the fasting, it's not an accident that it tastes really good, it's very comforting, and about a quarter of a bone broth, a quarter cup of bone broth is, it really is uh, satisfying. So I recommended that for my mother when she was having her 40 days that she had to fast, a life or death moment for her. And then as I've gone forward with patients, we start with a fourth of a cup and then I have them set a timer, like really pause long enough to listen to your system. And I think that's an, another major skill that's happening during fasting is that patients learn to listen to their bodies. Uh, that's not always easy. Uh, they've been on rote, um, uh, kind of detached concentration for a long time. So to ask them to really hone in and listen, do you feel full? That isn't easy and it's a learned skill. Uh, there's several fat-based hormones that are in charge of giving you that sensation of fullness. 
and when you first start out on a ketogenic diet, you're pretty wimpy at making them. So I would contend that if you are just new into ketosis, please wait a couple of weeks before you try your first fast, uh, especially if you're over the age of 40. Just give your body a chance to really get used to a ketogenic diet and making these hormones. You will be rewarded beyond measure if you can wait long enough for your system to rev up and make these fat-based hormones. If you've been on a low-fat diet for the last you know, 10 years, five years, whatever, your system is very inefficient at making these hormone or these, um, these signals, these proteins that are really derived from fat. So without the fat in your system, you've made low amounts of them. If you would measure your cholecystokinin or your, um, your um, leptin, which is another satiety hormone, they just aren't very high. You make little bitty blips in the markers instead of these peaks and valleys, which is what you're supposed to do. The longer you're on a fat-based diet, the more it, it, it supports the base of an immune system, which is again, very highly connected to how well you fed fat to your system. Um, in a ketogenic diet, it's fats without carbohydrates, and that is a caveat if you're just learning about this. So um, I have a couple of things that I wanted to go through that have been big questions. So number one is what do you drink? I showed you that gelatinous bone broth. That's one thing that I let people drink. We're trying to keep the calories I mean, zero is perfect, but I really, if you're gonna count, uh, you know, if you're trying to learn what's, what's the next goal I could reach for, trying to keep those calories under 300 is really helpful. Um, so bone broth has pretty low calories. Um, sometimes my bone broth, you'll see a skim of fat on the top. So of course those fats have calories. The longer you're in ketosis, the, um, the better and more efficient your system is at grabbing fats from the storage that we've been using instead of putting them down the gullet. Um, we want you to uh, kind of use those fats that have been stored. Um, when we look at um, other, other drinks that I let people have or I encourage my patients to have, one of them is something called kombucha. And so kombucha is what I'm gonna focus on tonight. That word is kind of goofy, but uh, kombucha is a fermented drink. So a few weeks ago, I started my kombucha batches here, and I'm gonna show you a close up here on the video. Uh, kombucha is made from tea. So I take black tea, about 10 bags of black tea and about a cup or two of, uh, about a cup and a half actually of honey. And I put the honey and the tea with it. And you say, but doc, that's not, that's not ketogenic. And I'm like, you're right, it's not ketogenic. Uh, but the unique part about kombucha is that you use uh, it is a fermentation where you use some bacteria and yeast to process that sugar. And the longer the system processes, uh, the more fermented it becomes and the lower the sugar content. Now, I'm kind of a geek. I don't like to guess on how much sugar is in my uh, drink. So I do a few things that are pretty um, um, evidence-based, if you would. Um, so the first thing we do, <laughs> I'll tell you when my uh, foreign exchange student did an interview at our house, she said, I think her kitchen is kind of like a mad scientist lab <laughs> because I was doing a batch of kombucha and I had a SCOBY uh, that was out, uh, it was not in with the tea at the time. Uh, this is an example of SCOBY that's kind of gnarly, but this is, uh, a SCOBY is, stands for a, um, the S is for symbiotic, uh, C is for colony, the O is for of, and then the B is for bacteria, and the Y is for yeast. So SCOBY, which is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. And that's what this thing is. It's in the shape of a circle, because that's what it's been growing in for the last couple of uh, uh, batches of kombucha. But I take that sweetened tea and I add, I add this SCOBY to the top of it. I'm just gonna show you on live uh, video that you can pull off layers of uh, this bacterial uh, colonies. They kind of grow in layers. I don't know if you can see me pulling that layer off. But as you do that, it just kind of shows, it's really kind of gnarly actually. It feels weird <laughs> if I leave it laying in the kitchen sink with some, uh, in between batches I have to keep the bacteria and yeast fed and so I'll leave it in some uh, uh, just Tupperware or something and I'll put some honey on it and keep it growing and I'll call them my kitchen pets. <laughs> my teenagers think this is unbelievable. Anyway, so that's what a SCOBY looks like, but I'm going to show you a little closer about the four batches of 
um, of kombucha that I've got growing here. So if you look, um, let's see here. <laughs> There we go, I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so here are four batches of kombucha, and you can see I've got them in some just glass jars, um, and I'm just gonna push on this. You can kind of see the bubbles that come through on that. Uh, let see if I can get it all focused in there. Uh, here's another one. You can just see the bubbly part of that. Uh, I've taken the, the lid off of this one, and just showing you that it smells like, you know, fermented tea. Um, and that's a great step, but what is most important is that you buy one of these little fellows. So this is a uh, pH monitor, and you can get them on af off of Amazon for pretty cheap. And um, it allows you to check what the pH is of your, of your substance. So I always start by checking out what, what vinegar looks like. So I put some vinegar in this, uh, in this uh, cup and you can see that vinegar turns out to be, um, should be about 2.7. Uh, let's see what I get. Uh, 3.0 is what this is reading right now. So it usually reads about 2.9 or 3.0. It's been sitting here and I think I put a little bit of <laughs> kombucha in there so it kind of blended. Um, but what it is, is it just tells me a digital reading is have I let the bacteria and yeast fermented my tea enough to allow it to be something I would drink on a ketogenic diet. So yeah, 2.9 is what it did turn out to be in the end if you just let it sit there. So that's just vinegar, plain old vinegar. But when I put uh, the, when I put it in my, see if I can keep you on camera here. If I put the little monitor in my kombucha and you let it sit still for about yeah, five, six, six, five or six seconds, this pH for the kombucha that's been brewing for about um, I think this was at like 11 days. So this is at 3.8 or 3.7. And I really like to get it about 3.4 before I turn it off and put it in jars. Um, it sounds a little high maintenance, but uh, I'll tell you, I've bought kombucha at the, at the store before and their kombucha has about eight grams of carbs per serving in it. And it totally threw me out of ketosis. I wasn't making ketones. I'm insulin resistant in the past and my mom was too fragile to play games, so I needed to test it. And the pH of these was closer to 3.8, 3.9, um, and it had plenty of sugar in it. And you could taste it, <laughs> it tasted sweet. You get something like a vinegar and it tastes like vinegar. I mean, it tastes um, more acidic. Uh, and that uh, is, a, uh, is the opposite of having high sugar. Um, if you've heard of any of the wives tales about saying, you know, doc, what do you think about apple cider vinegar? I'm like, I think pretty good things about apple cider vinegar. I just can't get patients to usually drink it. Um, it's very acidic and it does kind of help fight some of that high sugar moments. It really does kind of temper the system down into a more alkaline state when you add such an acidic component like vinegar or apple cider, apple cider vinegar. Um, and it usually just takes a small amount of vinegar to quench whatever craving you're going through. Much like Himalayan salt, you can really see the taste buds fire to the brain that, hey, I don't need much of this. Um, so um, when I look at using a store-bought kombucha, it's not that I never do that, it's that I try not to. Um, so I have four teenagers to f supply with a kombucha uh, they didn't drink it at first, but they do now. And then the two other things I've learned is to get these caps that um, if you drink beer, you're going to notice which kind of bottle this is, but I won't say that on air. Uh, so it's the kind of self-sealing ones where you can kind of just flip it. And then it, um, because the bubbles inside are real <laughs> and they do make it taste better when it has this kind of um, bubbly fermented uh, drink to it. Um, if you go to Costco, you'll recognize these bottles too. I did take the label off of it. I still got some condensation in this one, but um, again, it just seals itself and that way I can put it in the fridge. And once I hit a pH of about 3.5, I'll put it in the fridge and then it doesn't um, go bad, but it also doesn't keep fermenting all the way to complete vinegar. If I get a pH of 3.2, the kids will not drink it. It's too vinegary. So I try to stop it around 3.6 or 3.5, put it in the fridge. It may, it may ferment a little bit lower, but that's about as 
far as I would do it and ask him to drink it. So this is again another drink that I think is a great drink for a fast. Um, not the whole bottle, but it to quench a thirst if you're really having trouble, if you're really struggling through a craving, kombucha is a great fermented drink. And one of the things about fermented foods is our society doesn't drink many of these. We would much prefer the sweetened drinks, which are high in um, either sweeteners, uh, artificial or regular, um, and that really quick satisfaction of dopamine. But boy, it doesn't play out well. The more, longer you drink it, the more you're going to want it. And that is a trade-off for how well you can find a reward for your drink. You're going to have a great boost of dopamine if it's got sugar in it, but boy, it's going to kick you in the butt about an hour later when the cycle of a high glucose uh, drink is going to give you a crashed energy. So I really like the kombuchas that I make at home because I can monitor them. And if, you, <laughs> if you've tried to start a SCOBY, I would tell you to pause. <laughs> I've tried to order the SCOBY bacteria off of, offline. I never got it to grow. Um, but uh, if you've, SCOBYs usually have to like, if you get a live version from a friend, that's how I would recommend you do it. Um, another little trick that I've learned about making uh, kombucha is I don't know if you can see this pan that I have the, um, I'll just kind of make sure you can see that. <laughs> if you're in South Dakota and you have a dog kennel that needs to stay warm, uh, this is the thing you put under the mat that <laughs> the dog kennel sits on so that they don't freeze when they're outside in South Dakota. But it's a very low temperature heating pad. So we use that <laughs> here to just give it a little extra heat. And instead of taking like three weeks to heat up the kombucha, it only takes about a week and a half. So um, last thing I wanted to do um, was to let you know that I am checking blood sugars and ketones. I've had a couple more questions about that, that why do you check those? And again, uh, I could stand to lose another 15 pounds, but that's not what I'm doing this for. When I look at um, what I check these numbers of blood glucose and blood ketones for, I really do this as a way to show patients that it's a different level of um, uh, like intensity for your fasting. So in people that are just newly fasting, if you check your blood sugars, that's probably enough. Uh, peeing on a ketone stick is again, the first couple of fasts, don't get too overwhelmed. But if you get to a level where you've been fasting for a few times and you wanna know, did you hit autophagy? Um, again, we can't just do a blood test to say, did you hit autophagy? But we can do some guesses about how low did your insulin get while you were fasting, and that's one of the best ways to measure uh, or to estimate, did you have uh, autophagy? So we want those blood sugars pretty low, uh, definitely under 100 if they can get into the 80s or 70s, that's even better. But we want it in conjunction with a pretty good level of ketones. So that's why we use a ratio. Uh, I go through this in the book if you haven't, if this, this is new to you. Um, but I have a couple of patients uh, over the last few weeks who've just been really confused about, you know, what, what's my goal? And I think it's unique for every patient. Um, I've got patients who are in the weight loss phase and they just wanna use uh, intermittent fasting and ketosis for weight loss. I would do their ratio, which is their blood glucose divided by their blood ketones. And we'd want their ratio to be at least um, below 100. Um, if you can get it below, you know, between 170, that's a good range. If you're in that phase and you're looking for weight loss and in your fast you reach that for a good 24 hours, you're gonna for sure have ignited the autophagy within your system. However, if you're looking for some reversal of inflammation due to an autoimmune disease, uh, boy, I push my patients to have a, a ratio between 70 and 50. Um, that 70 and 50 is again more intense, so that either means that the blood sugars need to be lower or the ketones need to be higher. Uh, so checking, you can't guess on these things, you gotta look. So you gotta poke your finger, write down your numbers, I know that sounds intense, but if you follow me on social media, I try to post those numbers while I'm fasting, uh, just as a way to say it's not that hard, and here's what I'm thinking, and then over time, people kind of get the hint, you know, kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, but when it was my mom, and she was looking at what could we do for her cancer ratio, uh, she, we really needed her ratio to be less than 20. 
That's really intense. Please do not try to do that without a doctor watching what you're doing. Uh, we wanted her blood sugars in those 60s and we wanted ketones, you know, if we could hit three, sometimes when she was in a good wave of her stress response, we could get ketones up to five. So we had really good stress responses. Um, I mean, really good ketone response. So again, we're taking the blood sugar, we're dividing by, uh, dividing the uh, ketones by, by that. And so if we could get her number or any of my cancer patients under 20, that's when we really think we're putting a great stress on those cancer cells. And of course, you cannot reach that ratio unless you've been practicing a, a life of ketosis. Uh, for these patients with cancer, it really is life or death. Um, which brings me back to the final thing about what I wanted to dedicate this week's fast for. So today I went to church and one of my long-term buddies at church I hadn't seen in a while and uh, I just hadn't heard much about where he'd been. He showed up at church and he had clearly lost a lot of weight. Uh, he was walking with a walker and I asked, gee, what's the matter? And he said, haven't you heard? I have esophageal cancer. And instantly my heart broke because that's just a difficult cancer to navigate and to survive and I'm, I'm sure when that, that diagnosis came to him, which has been many, several months now actually, um, uh, he probably lost a lot of hope uh, that if you read anything about this on the internet, um, those are a tough cancer, esophageal cancer. So he's about three weeks uh, post-surgery. Uh, he's had radiation and chemo and he had surgery a few weeks ago and this morning <laughs> we sat down to church and I had one of my sons run out to my car and go grab my book uh, to say, you know what, um, if there's one thing I've learned about uh, this book, it's that it does give people hope. Um, I didn't write this book with much more of an intention that it was for my mom. And how can I write down the little lessons uh, of what we were doing to teach her about a ketogenic lifestyle. She was 71 when the cancer started, turned 72 within weeks of our ketogenic diet, and now is 74. And she is more vibrant uh, and more alive than she's been in 40 years. Um, when we started the diet, she had, you know, at best six months to live if she wasn't going to do chemo, which is what had happened. That's what sparked me to become very intense about the ketogenic diet. <clears throat> Once she got into the ketogenic diet, we have ended up back on chemo. In fact, she's on chemo again right now. But again, she's living. It's not the zombie that we were working with before. Um, her life is alive and, and, and very filled with hope. And so um, I've said a couple of times before that if you're fasting just because, you probably aren't going to do very well. <laughs> I don't anyway. When I fast, I have to have a patient in mind or somebody that I can pray for or help when I get in that moment of just wanting something to eat. So I'm sure over the next couple of days when I get a craving, when I want to eat <laughs> instead of fast, uh, what I'm gonna do is think of my friend from church today and I'm gonna you know, say a prayer for him and I'm gonna use that moment of uh, sacrifice to say, no, I can get through this. Uh, it, it seems like a little problem until when you compare it to somebody who's facing a life or death situation with something like uh, esophageal cancer. Um, so a couple of other things that I, I know I handed him the book this morning and, but I, and I've done this a few times before where their, their brain's just not working very well. Um, in those cases, I do, I do push them to either go to an audio, the audio book. I read the book to my mom, it's like I'm reading it to my mom. Um, but the book um, is, I think that's the best one. The audio book I think turned out better than any of the others. I mean, the book is about the book, but um, and then if they can't focus, if you know, an audio book also is just too much for their brain, they're just too sick to be able to focus, um, that's really why I did those YouTube videos is that I broke down sections of the book and uh, have continued to add just different pockets of how, uh, how do you get uh, somebody who's really sick um, to you know, better identify what, um, what steps you can take to be on a ketogenic diet and why would you even wanna do that? And those are the things that we break down within like 10 minute videos on YouTube. So I will um, take a minute to read all of your posts, but I'll do that once I click off. Um, I know that the proper way to do Facebook Live and YouTube Live is to uh, read them as I go, but I just can't do it all by myself. So 
Someday here, I'm gonna get an assistant and we're gonna do this together. But until then, my kids and I are doing the best and I just wanna say good luck if you're fasting. If you are joining the fast, I would love to hear that on your comments that I am, I, I am doing a fast and then, you know, set a goal. Uh, my goal this time is to get to 72 hours. I'm gonna do it in the name of this, um, this friend from church and um, I'd love to see if you join me. So thanks for tuning in. And again, I hope if you've uh, never made kombucha, I hope this didn't scare you away. Um, and I will look forward to responding to your comments. Thank you.